Hello, this is Devdutt Patnaik. Uh, can you hear me clearly? I just want a thumbs up to make sure because we're dealing with technology. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, mythology, so I write on mythology and for the last 25 years, I have been given lectures on mythology. So before I start any talk, I try to explain the meaning of mythology and then connect it with the topic at hand. So uh, mythology is cultural truth. How do I uh, see the world? Different cultures see the world differently and that's their myth. Uh, from a practical point of view, uh, if fact is everybody's truth, which is based on measurement, then fiction is nobody's truth based on imagination, fantasy. Myth is somebody's truth. So I have a truth, you have a truth, and we can exchange ideas and understand each other's truth. And that is the world of mythology. Um, in mythology, you don't argue. You know, when you believe that what you know is the truth and everybody else does not know the truth, then you go into argument, right? You go into vivad. But uh, in the world of mythology, you say that, you know, I know something. I have my truth and you know something and you have your truth and let's have a conversation. Let's do some of that and understand each other. Right. So the world of mythology is basically trying to make sense of the world. And the thing is, nobody really knows everything about the world. We know the material stuff, the measurable stuff, uh, the things that you can use with a scale. But when it comes to emotional matters, we get uh, a bit lost. We don't quite understand um, what's going on. And that's where mythology comes in. Like, for example, what happens after death? If I ask this question, no scientist can answer this question. What is the purpose of life? How, why am I alive? These fundamental questions are something that no scientist can answer. And therefore, we go to maybe a psychiatrist, a guru, a teacher, a religious leader, maybe holy books, and we start entering these spaces. And that's why mythology becomes very interesting. But then what is a mythologist doing in a conference related to wealth? Now, and this is something that people ask me a lot. Why do you talk on economics? Why do you talk on money? Why do you talk on wealth? Why do you talk on power and politics? And I tell people that, you know, one of the most popular goddesses in India is Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. In fact, from an archaeological point of view, the oldest goddess to have ever been created in artwork is the goddess Lakshmi. So if you go to Barhut or Sanchi, which are Buddhist sites, ancient Buddhist sites, which are over 2000 years old, around these stupas or Buddha stupas, these were the, where the relics of the Buddha were kept, there were railings and on the railings, there were these images from the Jataka tales and there are the images of Lakshmi, the same image that you find in people's homes today. For example, if you go to a bank or a restaurant, you will see these images of Lakshmi or in the finance department of many companies, the goddess is shown seated on a lotus flower with elephants on either side, pouring water over her. In her hand, uh, there is a pot overflowing with grain and gold. And this exact image is found 2,200 years ago in a Buddhist stupa. Now, isn't Buddha about... Uh, you know, life is suffering, give up desires and you'll be happy. It's about nirvana. it's about monks, it's about uh, otherworldly spiritual things. Then what is this image of Lakshmi doing on a Buddhist stupa? And this is where the idea of wealth has to be understood. Indians had a very powerful understanding of wealth in the larger sense. And let's go to the beginning. Let's go to the very basics and the fundamentals to understand the meaning of wealth, right? So the first thing to understand is, uh, you know, let's look at organisms without human beings. Let's remove human beings from the picture. Let's go to nature. Let's look at nature like the rishis did. You know, the rishis were the people who looked at nature and they realized there's a fundamental difference between uh, non-living things and living organisms. So non-living objects, a jeeva, they are not alive. 
and sajiva, that which is alive. So, a jiva is the elements of stone, uh, water, wind, fire. And then there are the living things, uh, the plants, the animals, the predator, the prey. And they said, okay, what's the difference between a non-living thing and a living organism? And they realized that the fundamental difference is hunger. Bhook lagti hai. The living organism is hungry and is chasing food. Objects don't. The rock is not hungry. Water is not hungry. Wind is not hungry. It moves, but it is not seeking anything. There is no target. The wind is not seeking anything. The clouds are not seeking anything. They may contain rain, but they are not seeking the mountains. They are drawn. They are moved by various physical forces. So the world of physics and chemistry, if you study physics, if you study chemistry, you are studying, uh, you know, as I said, the rocks, the metals, the gems, uh, radiation. You never talk about hunger. You talk about power, momentum, force, velocity. You never talk about hunger. But the moment you come to the life sciences, the moment you talk about zoology, botany, about animals and plants and even microorganisms, you start talking about Hunger, food, and that food, the target is food, bhog. And that word for target in Sanskrit is laksh, from where you get the concept lakshmi. I have a target. If I get the target, the plants. Look at the plants, look at the animals. When you look at the plants, uh, you see the leaves, you see the roots. The plants are going in search of water. The plants are going in search of sunlight. They're seeking sunlight. They're seeking water because that's their lush. That's so that they stay alive. Look at animals. The deer is searching for the grass. The tiger is searching for the deer. The snake is looking for the rat. The eagle is looking for the snake. And therefore, in nature, all the movements are based and driven by hunger. Lakshmi. So, bhog and bhogi, the one who is chasing the food and the one that is food. So, this is the world of biology. And in that, human beings appear, the purusha. The human beings appear and we are also looking for food. Why do we go to work? We go to work at the very least, at the very fundamental. Why did human beings create culture? Why did we start agriculture? Why did we uh, start animal husbandry, the primary occupations? Why did we do mining? We are doing this because we want to survive. We want food, clothing, shelter, transportation. We want things. We have a target, laksh. And so laksh, say lakshmi. That's what has emerged. And that is the origin of the concept of wealth. So wealth is created in order to survive. That's the fundamental reason. The people say, I, what does money give us? And you know, some people say that money is all that you need. And the other side, you'll have people who will say, uh, no, money doesn't buy you happiness. But money does buy you comfort. There is no negotiation on that. You have money, you can get a business class ticket. You have money, you can buy a bigger flat, a bigger car, you, know, you can travel by airplane. So money buys you comfort and that is non-negotiable. That is what wealth brings to the table. Happiness is a broader concept because there are many other things involved in it. But comfort, definitely. And that idea is explained beautifully. You know, if you look at an image of Shiva, and in an art, when you look at the image of Shiva, Shiva is called the Digambara. He is covered with ash and he wears animal hide and he has, he owns nothing. He is Mahadev. He says, I have outgrown hunger. I have no need for food. I don't need anything. And I am the great Shiva. And he's covered with ash, Bhagut. He's Digambara. He is sky clad. He doesn't own anything. He has no property. And what is interesting is in art, when you see an image of uh, Mount Kailas, they will show it's a mountain of stone covered with snow when nothing grows. Nothing grows. And Shiva doesn't care, you know, because he says, I'm not hungry. 
I mean, imagine you look at the image of Shiva and there is, he has a bull called Nandi. And you ask the question, what does Nandi eat on Mount Kailas? There is no grass. And then you see his wife, Parvati, has a tiger. And you look at her and say, what the, does the tiger eat the bull? This is no right. Tiger doesn't eat the bull because he's not hungry. Around Shiva's neck, there is a snake. And you say, what does the snake eat? Does it eat Ganesha's rat? And the snake says, no, I'm not hungry. I don't eat Ganesha's rat. And then you see Kartikeya's peacock. And does the peacock attack uh, the snake? And the peacock says, no, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry at all. And that is Mount Kailas, this great place where you're not hungry at all. But now you contrast this with Vishnu. And when you look at the image of Vishnu, and you suddenly realize that Vishnu is wearing pitambar, silk. He is wearing fabric, which means, how do you make fabric? You need someone to grow cotton. India was the land which gave cotton to the world. So somebody made the cotton, somebody spun uh, uh, the thread, then somebody wove it into cloth, somebody dyed the yellow color, the special yellow color, which India was famous for. It was made by giving cows uh, mango leaves, and then the urine was distilled in a very powerful way to create this bright yellow color called Pitambar. India was very famous for this India yellow uh, color. And then you, uh, Vishnu also is wears pearls and rubies and sapphires and emeralds and he has a he has a crown how do you get a crown you need miners you need smelters you need jewelry makers in other words you need an ecosystem a commercial ecosystem you need farmers craftsmen uh, you know he wears chandan uh, perfume he um, loves uh, you know he loves butter how do you make butter you need Cows, which means you need pasture land, which means you need to collect the cows, you have to collect the milk, you have to turn it into butter, and you have to turn that into ghee. That's a lot of labor industry. So when you look at the image of Vishnu, you suddenly realize they're talking about settlement, industrialization, versus Shiva, who is the hermit, who says, Mushko kuch nahi chahiye, mein ko bhook nahi lagti hai, he's Mahadev. While the devas want food, when you read the Rig Veda, the devas are called and said, here, take food. Agni is called and said, take food to the gods, because the gods are hungry. And Shiva says, I am Mahadev, I am not hungry at all. And then you ask yourself, so is the purpose of life to get food or to outgrow hunger itself? And these are questions that our scriptures are talking about. Because Devata, what is a Devata? When you do the Yagya in the old Vedic rituals, the gods were called and given food, Ahuti, and do Swaha. You give them something. At the end of it, you will ask the gods, give me something in return. So the Yajaman will call the Devata. He will do Swaha, give something to the gods. And uh, in exchange, he will do Falastuti and say, give me something. Give me Tathastu. Give me what I want. So Swaha becomes investment in the gods and Tathastu becomes the return on investment from the gods. And that's the world of the Vedas, the Yajna, the ritual of Yajna, which unfortunately in English we translate as sacrifice, means exchange. In the Yajur Veda, it is said, Dehi ma dadami te, give me what I give you. And so the concept of me giving you something and expecting something from you is what creates the yajna. And that is what we see in that is what we see in the Vedas. And then Shiva comes along and says, no, 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 I'm not hungry at all. I don't want anything. The purpose of life is to conquer hunger itself. There should be no hunger. There should be no ambition. There should be no need, no want. We should be like Mount Kailas. And you're like, okay, I worship Shiva. It's great. But I mean, not having a goal in life sounds a little strange and you're a little uncomfortable. How come Hinduism is giving these two different ideas? You know, you go to the temple and they'll say, give Naivedya to the gods. You're giving something to the gods, Naivedya. Why are you giving food to the gods? The gods are hungry. Unko bhok lagi hai, so bhok chadao. And then we are told that the gods will give you something in return, the prasad. We go to the temple because we want prasad, but they are told, we are told, you will not get prasad until you do naivedya. You won't get anything unless you give something. Unless you invest, you will not get a return. So that's one lesson we get. On the other side, we get a lesson of Shiva, who is Mahadev, who says, 
you should not want anything not give up give up everything the buddha image and then that brings us back to the stupa with lakshmi over there and then you have another third image of vishnu over there who is wearing pitambar silk gold and you're like hey wait a minute what is going on i'm confused what is the message here and this is how mythology look at how hindu mythology brings in economics and spirituality together at one level you have yagya which is transaction give in order to receive give in order to receive give in order to receive so you're talking about a marketplace where you exchange and look i'm not saying give and take which is a contractual obligation i'm saying give and then receive pehle do fir lo naivedya and then prasad that's the world of transaction then the second world of spirituality which is saying give up hunger and then there's a third world of vishnu and vaikuntha where lakshmi sits the the ocean of milk we are told And you're like, wait a minute! Is there something more here that we are missing? What's the missing conversation? And the missing conversation is this: Shiva says, "I am not hungry at all. I am like, मेरे को भूख नहीं लगी है. I don't. I'm not hungry at all. I don't want anything." And the goddess comes to him and says, "You know what? You are not hungry. But what about the rest of the world? What about the others who are not Mahadev? Does their hunger not matter at all?" other people who are hungry are you not interested in their hunger don't you want to ensure they get food that they get the knowledge to outgrow hunger what about their material and spiritual growth and shiva says no oh, that's a very good idea i never thought of it i never realized that it's not just about me it's also about others and that is something that we don't understand because we focus so much on ourselves you know the modern management techniques are designed around self even maslow when you read maslow maslow is continuously talking about self actualization maslow is continuously talking about self actualization he is not talking about others at all he talks about me my growth my th- even now self help gurus and self help books is about you you should succeed you should succeed we never talk about other people that we belong to an ecosystem of people we have employers we have partners shareholders consumers that real growth happens when other people make money you make money when other people make money this concept that other people should make money is the big idea that hindu mythology talks about because vishnu says in the when you see the vishnu purana and when you read the stories of vishnu vishnu says well i am not hungry at all but still i will invest in the market because other people are hungry i have to enable others to grow i will so what do i do what do i do i just i have extra money should i just give it to away to people he says no if i give it away to people they will waste it i will invest in other people i will give them wealth but i will invest it and they are obliged to return it to me some will succeed some won't but they have to give it back to me and this brings us to the concept of loan because if i give you something and expect something from you i have now given you a loan and you have to repay back to me and in sanskrit the word for loan is rin and rin is a very important idea in hindu spiritual traditions in jain spiritual traditions in buddhist spiritual traditions in fact in global traditions debt as an idea you know we always talk about cash and money but did you know that globally before money was invented in many cultures there is no concept of money but there is many in each and every culture in the world there is the concept of debt rid i owe you and you owe me and the whole world runs on the principle of debt and debt repayment and therefore obligations expectations money came much later money was invented 2500 years ago and one you know the word cash just as a aside the word cash comes from india the sanskrit word from where the word cash is derived is kashapana so 2500 years ago in the gangetic plain merchants were using the earliest currency 
made of silver and lead coins called kashapana from where we get the word word cash and that the money economy thrived in india for a long time there were traders businessmen the jain traders the jain businessmen the buddhist traders the buddhist businessmen in fact jataka tales talks about so many merchants there is the story of value creation of the mouse merchant a, a man there is a merchant who is walking on the road and makes a casual comment that if someone can sell that dead rat he is a good businessman and is overheard by a beggar and he wonders what does that mean he picks up the dead rat and then he wonders what to do with it how can he make money out of a rat and then the cat comes there and wants the rat and he refuses to give it to the um, cat and the cat's owner is a big man he throws a copper coin at the beggar and says please give him the rat here is copper coins for you and uh, the beggar takes the copper coin gives the rat to the merchant's mouse and learns a lesson that in the market people come because they are hungry and if you provide good and service goods and services to the hungry you make money and so he used the two copper coins to get a pot of water he gets a pot fills it with water sits outside in the city gate and when he sees thirsty travelers coming in he would give them a cup of water and the thirsty travelers you know the, there were these flower merchants who would come in and they would drink water from him and say thank you so much what do you want in exchange because now we are in your debt we hum aap aapke rini hain give me something tell us what you want you have given me water what can i give to repay the debt and he says give me a bunch of flowers and they give him a bunch of flowers and he collects the bunch of flowers and he sells those flowers in the temple in the evening makes more copper coins and thus he increases his wealth by not taking a loan but by giving a loan so you realize the concept of taking a loan and giving a loan enabling the other and enabling yourself the cyclical structure is what makes uh, connects indian philosophy very strongly the idea of rin and this is related to the idea of spirituality of moksha when we use word like freedom moksha mukti what does it mean it means freedom from debt when you repay all your debts you will be free and that state is called moksha and suddenly it starts making sense so they will say a man has to repay debt to who to his parents to his ancestors to his family to his culture to nature also because all we owe our existence to all these entities we owe our existence to our family to our society to culture to nature and therefore we are all born in debt we are hum sabhi rini hai and we spend our entire life repaying this debt we repay debt to parents we repay debt to family we repay debt to society to nature you can't just consume you have to also give something back you know today you are seeing talk, people talk about climate change why is that because you have taken loan from nature and not repaid nature back when you read the brahmana literature and the veda literature they will always say he who consumes must be consumed the eater has to be eaten in nature every living organism that eats gets eaten by someone else jeevo jeevatsya jeevanam life feeds on life what has happened to our society today we say we want to consume but we will not be consumed and that is not the way society because that is a one way traffic i eat but i will not feed i will i will keep consuming but i will not share and this creates a problem and that is the story where the goddess is telling shiva that you may not be hungry but you need to provide for others now if you provide for others they come into your debt so they have to now repay the loan and you see this in the tirupati balaji temple in andhra pradesh they say that vishnu is on earth because he was following lakshmi he wanted to get a place to stay he marries the local princess but in order to marry the local princess he has to give a bridal price in order to get the bridal price he needs to get money so he goes to kuber and takes a loan 
and he takes the loan but now he can't go back to vaikuntha he cannot get moksha he vishnu himself cannot go back to vaikuntha because he is in debt and the debt is building up so he asks his devotees can you please give me some money so that i can free myself from debt the devotees give him money now the fact that the devotees have given him money he is now in the debt of devotees so he has to repay them by enabling them to be prosperous and the rule of the game was this <coughs> if anybody gives you x you have to return x plus y and when i give you more than what i get now you are again in my debt now that you are in my debt you have to repay me then i will repay you again and the cycle continues which is the chakra of vishnu this is why vishnu is called chakradhara the wheel which is rotating of lenders and borrowers and lenders and borrowers which creates an economic ecosystem which is why vishnu is associated with lakshmi and if you look if you are deep into mythologies this is advanced level mythology on vishnu's left chest there is a mark called shri vats it is the footprint of lakshmi now normally during diwali festival in your house you would have had an image of lakshmi and two footprints pointing towards your door saying that lakshmi should enter my house so two footprints are drawn entering the house but on vishnu's chest there is only one footprint and we ask our question where is the second footprint that is lakshmi's footprint lakshmi pada where is the second footprint and he says that my friend is in your house that is in the house of my bhaktas lakshmi has to keep moving between her house and my house because only when she rotates is value created look how through storytelling they are explaining the concept of dispensing wealth of keeping wealth in circulation of not hoarding wealth of sharing wealth they are talking about debt escaping debt return on investment all these concepts through storytelling of shiva and vishnu and yagya and deva and mahadev and lakshmi all the stories constantly talking about exchange and return you know krishna gives his friend comes to his house and gives him some food to eat sudama very poor so poor Uh, that he comes to krishna's house to ask for help but he says no you know i cannot just come and ask for help i must give before i receive dehi ma dadami te give me what i give you so he has nothing but he doesn't eat for 3 days and he carries 3 days worth of puffed rice and gives it to krishna and krishna says this man has given me everything that he possesses what should i give him back i am in his debt i have to return the favor and he is about to give all his wealth to sudama when his wife catches his hand and says can i eat some of the rice too leave something for me you can't give everything to sudama you must give something to your family to pay yourself first before you pay others so this concept of payment and repayment of loan and dispersal of loan all is connected in these stories these are economic stories about money about wealth about well being you must have heard with this great concept and i'll conclude with this one big idea you must have heard of this dharma artha kama moksha these four words are the four pillars they say of indian thought let us understand this from an economic point of view dharma artha काम मोक्ष डी ए के एम अर्थ इज द जेनरेशन ऑफ वेल्थ वेर यू जेनरेट वेल्थ लॉट्स ऑफ वेल्थ काम इज वेन यू कंज्यूम द वेल्थ एंड एंजॉय द वेल्थ एंड इंडल्ज योर सेल्फ हैव अ ग्रेट पार्टी बाय अ ग्रेट हाउस बाय अ ग्रेट कार गेट योर प्राइवेट जेट वॉट एवर मनी यू वॉन्ट टू डू दैट इज द अर्थ पार्ट एंड द काम पार्ट धर्म पार्ट इज वेर यू यूज द वेल्थ to enable others not through charity but through investment indian thought doesn't like charity too much it always say invest 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 the word daan does not mean charity it means reinvestment in the market even if there is a risk go for that go to the market because you have to invest in the market that is dharma when i give back i get moksha freedom because i'm free of all the loans because only consuming puts me in debt 
but by reinvesting in the market i create an ecosystem of prosperity i enable others to succeed and that is how the idea of loan and lender and borrower all these ideas are part of indian spiritual traditions you know um, people say what happens when you die in the uh, judeo christian world there's a concept of qiyamah judgment day when you die you will be judged by god have you followed the rules have you not followed the rules haram and halal if you followed the rules you go to jannat if you have not followed them you go to jahannam in the indian concept there is no concept of judgment day the god is not a judge because indian said god is an accountant so you have concept like yamaraj the accountant and chitragupta his accountant scribe who makes a record of all the loans you have taken and all the loans that you have given if you have loans that you have given then you have to be repaid and therefore you will go to swarg where you will be repaid all the loans that you have dispersed if you have not repaid your loan and refuse to repay your loan you will go to naraka and be in debt because you want to escape so the whole cycle of swarg and nark is designed around loan giving and receiving giving and receiving which creates the chakra which is in the center of our india's flag the wheel of exchange which creates an ecosystem of prosperity and liberation is when like shiva you realize you are not hungry but you will still invest in the market and work with the market because other people have to be successful too and that becomes the purpose of your life i hope you reach the stage where you have more money than you need and all the extra money you will invest in the market thank you